he really didn't know how to do it. So ultimately we enrolled him in a driving school and it was really quite a sight seeing him getting behind the wheel and trying to drive and the lessons had to last much longer than we could stay there. So we paid the driving school and he went there every day for many, many months. And then finally his drug habit took hold of him once again and got the best of, of him and he ended up um, quitting the school. I hadn't heard from Ron in quite some time and then just last night I received a phone call from him when I looked at my cell phone and saw the 876 area code from Jamaica come up I was thrilled because I had been so worried about him and I didn't know when I would hear from him if I would hear from him again and he reported to me that he had endured a very tough experience that a man had tried to beat him to death with a hammer he had survived that and when the man discovered that he was still alive he attacked Ron again and cut off his finger. Ron said the man has gone to jail for four years and this was all because he was accused of being a cokehead he said. I just don't know exactly what happened but I can see from this that Ron's is continuing to suffer greatly from his deportation back to Jamaica. There are many cases in which no matter how much you do to try to help somebody they are their own worst enemy. And though there are many people out there who can be aided and can be helped, every once in a while you meet somebody who is not an example of that. And Ron was such a person. Sadly, I've concluded that there's very little that I can do at this point after many years of trying both in the United States and Jamaica to help him out. In the next session, I'd like to invite two of the people in Sidewalk, Warren and Grady, to come to class and visit with us to talk about some of their experiences. Our uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Cornell West, who is professor of religion and African American studies at uh, Princeton uh, University. Um, at last look, he had about 16 books on topics which we're all familiar with, and some were not, uh, race, pragmatism, democracy, and religion. Um, he holds 20 honorary degrees, as well as a National Book Award, and uh, we welcome him to the ASA. Let me first say it's an honor to be here, to be part of this discussion, reflecting on this very, very powerful and important film of my distinguished colleague and dear brother, Mitch. Uh, how rare it is for me to see someone who brings together such genuine sensitivity, mature receptivity, and, gen and deep empathy, wrestling with the underside of New York City, the Big Apple, wrestling with the night side of the American empire. I could see echoes of Du Bois in terms of lifting the veil and laying bare the rich humanity of black brothers their complexity, but never, never losing sight of their individuality. It is the sense of the idiosyncratic, eccentric aspects and facets of each brother, and yet at the same time always acknowledge, acknowledging their up against structural constraints. Because anytime you actually wrestle with uh, the vicious legacy of white supremacy in the history of the American empire, you're talking about the catastrophic and America is ingenious, rendering the catastrophic invisible. You're forced to confront the traumatic, the horrendous, the calamitous, and even anthrop urban anthropologists and sociologists, I know you all have your own language, it's diagnostic ethnography, Eric Oland Wright says, and that's one language, an anthropology of matrius which is another wonderful way of talking about it, building on this wonderful essay of, of Kim Hopper's in 1985 and the economics of makeshift and urban anthropology. But I just say it wrestling with the doings and sufferings of those particular people who must wrestle with the catastrophic, with the inferno in the midst of the American paradise. Now this particular project as a whole really begins on page 68 of Jane Jacobs' 1961 classic, which was invoked in the text, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And what's on that page? The self-appointed public characters. 
and you saw the rubric, public characters invoked in the film. Well, why is that important? It's important because there would be no masterpiece called Sidewalk. There would be no text or film without the coming together of a public character named Hakeem and another public character named Mitch. And this Dante's journey into the inferno is one in which Hakeem plays Virgil to Mitch's Dante. He's the guide. But the dynamic between the two needs to be highlighted precisely because without that coming together, and we should note that it's, 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 it, that Hakeem is in exile. This is the very language that he uses in his powerful afterword. He views the street sidewalk as a metropolitan refuge, as a way of gaining some distance from the violation, not just of his rights, but of his being by a white lawyer who actually drops popcorn on his head while he's engaging in his job reading Business Week. And he says, I either going to have to crush or kill this white mother hucker, or I'm leaving corporate America. Reminds you of exactly what happened to James Baldwin in Princeton in the restaurant when he said he threw, in fact, you all recall that in his essay, he throws the glass against, uh, at the white waitress. He says, I either got to leave America or I'm going to kill some of these folk. Rage, the rage of a bigger Thomas. That's what Hakeem is wrestling with. And it's then when he moves to the streets and encounters this sociologist who has his own kind of exile from the dull, monotonous, complacent, white, middle-class status. And it's their human coming together that constitutes the precondition of this lifting of a veil that we have all benefited from so deeply. At least I have, and I think most of us you would agree. You all agree with that? Let's give the film a, a hand first. <laughs> let's, let's be honest about that. But what does that mean? What, what, what kind of coming together are we talking about? Well, we're talking about two public characters, an intellectual from the academy, an intellectual on the street, who meet in a law lounge at NYU with first experiences of profound suspicion. Hakeem does not trust Mitch, just like much of black America does not Trust the American Sociological Association. Because <laughs> you don't have a good record over, hundred, over the decade and decade and decade of keeping track of the humanity of these kinds of brothers and sisters. That inferno has often been rendered so marginal that only when it constitutes a threat is it finally confronted. But Mitch says no. I'm actually going to wrestle with overcoming this suspicion. Why? Because I have a quest for truth, a quest for meaning, but I also have my own wrestling with what it means to be a person of intellectual and existential integrity. I mean, if I had a category for what, what, what you're actually doing, though, Brother Mitchell, I would call it a kind of existential sociology or a kind of phenomenology of the ethical dynamics of persons given the race line and the class line. Which means then that you have to have a profound intellectual humility, the kind that Drake and Caton had in 1945 in their classic of black metropolis or even the kind of Howard Becker in 63 of Outsiders. What does it really mean to so thoroughly call your own assumptions and presuppositions in the question that you engage in an active listening? And you see this invoked over and over again throughout the text as we saw it on the film. What does it mean for a mainstream to actually believe they can not only listen but learn something from the ways in which these people negotiate and navigate the inferno within the American paradise? And way, what are the ways in which the way in which they navigate are tied to who we are given the future of democracy, given that these people are very much a part of the democratic project, though often overlooked? In addition, there's a vulnerability, there's a risk that, that Mitch had to form a dialogue with Hakeem and say, I'm not only learning from you, but you can learn from me. 
And the dialogue meant what? That he had to be vulnerable. He had to take a risk. And vulnerability is one of the things, again, that are often so tamed and domesticated in mainstream. And I don't want to be too demonizing of white mainstream life, but for the moment, just say we'll be highly critical of <laughs> the blind spots and the wasted lives that are overlooked as Adorno points out so deeply in page 151 of Mini Moralia. What does it mean to keep track of those things that, that are not assimilated into that mainstream? And of course, many of us are in the mainstream but refuse to be mainstreamed. That's my description of being at Princeton. <laughs> but this risk and vulnerability and then in addition to that, the fragility of the provisional trust that emerges out of the hard work done between Hakeem and Mitch. That this product itself is part of a very, very contingent process in which a fragile trust is forged over time and as that trust is formed, both Mitch and Hakeem pr produce courageously new kinds of identities or at least new dimensions to their identities, not simply as intellectuals, but as human beings. Because what's at work for me in this film is really the ways in which these brothers are trying to define their sense of being, this existential. What does it actually mean to be human in light of what is coming at them? Now, we can all can tell stories about deindustrialization. We can tell stories about the repressive apparatus of the nation state and the role of the police. We can tell stories about the local law 45 and the various ways in which they eliminate the spaces. We can tell stories about the weakening of the family. We can tell stories about the decentering of the various familiar networks and kinship networks, the weakening of the kind of armor that these folk once had, their mothers and their grandmothers, yes. And if you do get a chance to read the text, turn to page 78 and see the picture of sister Aunt Naomi. Briefly you saw it in the film, but just look at it, 92 years old, and the ways in which her humanity is so much, uh, it's not just on display, but her, her dignity is far beyond that of her grandson. Even though she's broke as the Ten Commandments. What happens to that shift? What went into Aunt Naomi? such that her dignity and self-respect and self-confidence is so undeniable, and yet there's her son who's deracinated and rootless and questioning himself and violating himself and destroying himself. That's an existential dimension to the sociological analysis put forward here. What I'm saying in part is that this particular coming together of these two intellectuals from different parts and sectors of our society has had and continues to have very, very powerful effects and consequences even given the kind of policies in place and the kind of elites who rule at the moment. My, uh, what, if I have any criticisms of the text, it would be this. First, I do think that beginning with Jane Jacobs can be both fruitful, but it has its own limitations. Because she characterizes the city as a city of strangers, almost echoing the American Hamlet, Blanche Dubois. I depend on the kindness of strangers. You recall when she's uttered out, when she pushed out at the end of the streetcar named Desire, the great white literary blues man, Tennessee Williams. Well, she has very little sense, not just of the diversity and heterogeneity of Greenwich Village and Hudson Street where she lives, but she's not attentive to the catastrophic in 1961 at all. And part of the problem with mainstream discourse in the academy is you start with your framework of the lack of the catastrophic and then try to somehow amend your framework and get the catastrophic in, rather than starting from the very history of the catastrophic and looking at the mainstream through the lenses. I put it another way. The mainstream gaze at the catastrophic as opposed to looking at the mainstream through the gaze of those who are wrestling with the catastrophe. And I see Brother Mitch moving back and forth in that regard because the, the men are speaking themselves. But then at the same time, the 
framework itself goes back over and over again to Jane Jacobs. Jane, now Jane Jacobs is a towering public intellectual, let's be honest about this. But on the other hand, I think some of the starting points from which she and other sociologists begin needs to be thoroughly called into question. And by shattered, I don't mean overlooked and trashed. I mean incorporated, but in a very different kind of framework in this regard. The second point I would, I would note would be the West Indian dimension. The, the fact that Hakeem's parents from Virgin Islands, Ron from Jamaica, and you can look at the beautiful faces and tell. Mmm, looks like a little Barbados-like style there. That's a little different than Alabama, gut bucket, Jim Crow, Mississippi. Let me see. What kind of dynamics is going on within those black folk wrestling with the catastrophic with the new immigrants? Because for one thing, for Hakeem to be a second generation voluntary immigrant and then deal with the shock of the catastrophic in corporate America, how does that differ from someone like myself, seventh generation, eighth generation, I can't count, we don't have records, you see. But already prepared for the shock and therefore have different kinds of reactions in my case, but I mean, I'm not saying every person who comes out of my context has that, but that, that West Indian dimension is something that needs to be at least talked about, need to, needs to be explored in a certain way, you see. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, um, your fixed window theory, which I find fascinating, we don't have time to get into now, but that constructive, positive reform that's called it that Professor Hopper was talking about uh, needs to be talked about. It was not in the film, so I won't go into it. But I just thank you so very much for allowing me to have a few words about this wonderful uh, piece. Don't I? We're now at the uh, point in our program where uh, our discussants are going to make some observations um, about the film. And the uh, first uh, speaker is going to be uh, Kim Hopper. Uh, Kim Hopper is a, uh, a professor uh, in public health at Columbia University. He's a medical anthropologist who's done ethnographic and historic research, uh, historical research on psychiatric care uh, and the homeless, uh, concentrating on New, New York City. Um, he's the author of a classic book, uh, reckoning uh, with homelessness, and one of his other titles uh, caught my attention, uh, The Moral Economy of Care. Turn it over to you, uh, Professor Hopper. <clears throat> um, I, I probably should start by saying I'm sure it's no reflection on the bench depth of team sociology that the uh, organizers of this session have asked an anthropologist and a philosopher <laughs> to participate. There are, of course, the usual rumors of illicit substances, um, and, but those have been swirling since the 1960s, and until the lab results are in, I suggest we just ignore them. Uh, I'm going to try and stick to some prepared remarks. There's an awful lot to say about this film and the text that provoked it, um, and maybe we'll have some time to, to talk about that later. There are a number of reasons, however, that I, a sometimes scholar of homelessness and a student of cross-cultural fortunes of psychosis, am somewhat ill-equipped uh, for this charge. In the first place, as those of you who have read the book well know, a good proportion of these vendors are not homeless. A rare few, like Hakim, were on self-imposed sabbatical from the corporate grind. A few others, like Henry and Alice, had been recently laid off. More problematic still, some of those who might be considered in the book, not the film, loudly insist that they are homeless by choice. Others, Mudrick, for example, is of the awkward opinion that once homeless, always homeless. None of these options, a mixed population, an avowed preference, a destiny, much recommends itself to the usual premises of homelessness research. More to the point, and something I want to return to, homelessness today, although not historically, is defined by residents. To be homeless, as Peter Rossi taught us, is to, be home, is to lack customary and regular access to a conventional dwelling unit. 
sidewalk vendors, the noun has identity and purpose built into it, define themselves by the kind of work they do, the tribe they belong to, not where they sleep. Michtaneer's less than felicitous way of recognizing this fact, his insistent use of the adjectival unhoused, is by virtue of its own unlovely placement in a sentence, a call out to the reader to think about his word choice and why he made it. That too is a piece of mischief I want to return to. As Professor Malik um, mentioned, I make my own living in the divided house of public health. Crudely put, and risking caricature, on the one hand, the epidemiologies of homelessness and psychosis are all about structure. On the other, the anthropologies of same, mostly about agency. Risk is that contested field where the two meet. The epidemiologists do the necessary causal work of identifying and assessing those large, barreling social forces that convert ordinary deprivation and strain into hard decisions and sometimes lasting damage. The ethnographers, they sweat the small stuff over the long haul, documenting the post-traumatic daily grind to limit and distribute that damage. The one examines how economies shift and divisively make for homelessness. The other, how people made homeless shift for themselves. Largely because of my interest in the latter, I opened Sidewalk eight years ago. At the time, you could walk from the page to the stage and see for yourself, and have kept reading since. Sidewalk is a sort of practice theoretician's workshop production. It shows in the unhurried, unscripted encounters of the everyday how viable social orders take shape, circulate, get used and abused, test their resiliency, and prove up to the task or not. It documents how these men and a few women contrive a livelihood out of the excess use value, the discarded resor resources, waste spaces, and inadvertently, protective rules of the formal economy. It's an extended case study in an unplanned social project. And with rare and noteworthy exceptions, programs of assistance in mental health, homelessness, addiction services especially, are not. Instead, they segregate and stigmatize treating their clients